All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you from a, yes, we are back to a sunny San Diego after a lot of rain, actually an amazing amount of rain for, for this area. And today I am delighted to be joined from beautiful Kansas City by Mark Mears. How are you doing, Mark? Excellent, John. Um, I love San Diego. I wish I were there. Yeah, but I love well, Kansas City as well. So yeah, no, great, great places, absolutely. And Mark is the number one best-selling author, keynote speaker, consultant, and visionary business leader. He's significant track record of building shareholder value, driving innovation, and profitable company growth among world-class, high-profile brands such as PepsiCo, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, Frito Lay, J.C. Penney, NBC Universal, and the Cheesecake Factory. And today, Mark serves as Chief Growth Officer for. Leaf Growth Ventures LNC, a consulting firm. And what we're going to talk about today is the concept of the hybrid leadership, right? And Mark, and you you wrote a book, a best-selling book um, recently called The Purposeful Growth Revolution, Four Ways to Grow, Grow from Leader to Legacy Builder. So in the context of your research, what is what what are the components of a hybrid leader, maybe to start with, so people kind of get a baseline of what we're talking about? Yeah, great question, John. And thank you uh, again for having me come on your, your show. The uh, word revolution is not mere hyperbole. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about uh, the word revolution as I've dug into it, I've found three definitions that make sense, and especially in this context. The first is what you would probably expect, an uprising of the people. And the second is a dramatic change in the status quo. And the third is an object encircling another object. So if you go back to the idea of an uprising of the people, well, in this era of quiet quitting and the great resignation, which I actually refer to as the great repurposing, mm -hmm. because I think COVID has given us all a bit of a time out to reflect deeply on not only what, but who matters most in our lives. And you go back also to the research that was presented just a little over a year ago by the Sloan Management School at MIT, who surveyed 34 million people who left the workforce during COVID and asked them a simple question, why? Mm -hmm. Number one answer by over 10x higher than the second most uh, answers they were received was toxic work environment. Mm -hmm. So that's not a good. And then the second definition is a dramatic change in the status quo. And you think about the status quo before COVID, work was traditionally done in an office together with teams. And now today um, we're meeting on Zoom or any number of digital platforms to connect. Mm -hmm. And people are either working remote, uh, even though their offices have gone back or they're doing some sort of hybrid schedule and I just read a study that was done in the UK that's testing a four-day work week. Mm. So the idea of putting the genie back in the bottle is just not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So the last definition is this notion of an object encircling another, and that's really where we come in. We're whole people. Um, we were exposed to um, a different way of connecting during COVID. Mm -hmm. So a hybrid leader needs to be able to manage that change and still accomplish everything they want to accomplish, not just for themselves and their yeah. company, but starting with their team members mm -hmm. with a deeper level of listening and observation, uh, valuing them and empowering them to be their best. And when you break that down, it's an acronym mm -hmm. of love. Right. So my goal is to put the human back in human Excellent. resources. <laughs> Excellent. So, I mean, and I would, I would even say that it even started pre-COVID uh, yeah. on this mark as well, because I think my, I think if you go back to the financial crisis, right, the, the two thousand eight or whatever, yeah. whenever that was, I think that was one of the first times that, that a lot of people woke up to the fact that why am I living in some high cost area so I can commute for an hour and a half to an office. 
And then when there's a downturn in the economy, guess who gets let go? Me. And I'm stuck with an expensive mortgage in an expensive area where I can't get a decent job. And I think that started the process in COVID, obviously, where people are now going, well, why don't I find a good place where I want to live and how I want to operate and then find the job rather than the other way around? Yeah, I I think you're dead on, uh, John. I think that, you know, as oftentimes what we see happening when there are step function changes that go on in in society or civilization, um, you know, they're often driven by a catalytic event. Mm -hmm. And well, I think COVID is most notable uh, in that it really took something that you mentioned and I agree with a process and a mindset uh, that had already started, but I think Mm -hmm. it amplified it. It's almost like it, you know, it got put in a microwave and put on high, <laughs> and and it advanced the traditional change cycle uh, by maybe four or five years or more. I don't know, uh, but I do know that younger people have uh, a much different expectation of work than I know I did in yeah. my day, and, and and so there's this confluence of a different mindset, uh, a different upbringing. Um, the financial crisis and other events got people thinking a little deeper about, well, is that all there is? Mm-hmm. And then we started hearing more about purpose and looking at how we how we don't have to separate it from our lives and our work. Yeah. And what if we could put it together? And then COVID forced us to. <laughs> exactly. And then now here we are, and we're trying to figure this thing out. And 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 leaders are going to have to lead differently than the old command and control style yeah. that we used to revere. And, and yeah. salute to I, these strong leaders who, you know, just wrote books and we studied them and we thought this is great. That dog don't hunt mm-hmm. in today's new world of work. And and it require it requires a lot of like changing of of of, of your ideas, right? You know, because if, especially if you come up in a traditional work environment, you go. Uh, everybody's in the office and I can walk around and I can view my empire and all that great stuff. And now that's not there. Uh, But I have to learn how to be able to communicate with people, not just people who may be in offices, who may be remote, who may be, but also people who may be contractors who are on long-term contract. A lot of people are using Upwork now, right? Um, Generations. I mean, there's some, apparently there's five generations in the workplace right now. Yeah. So, so there's all these challenges because let's face it, most leaders are used to pretty much communicating in, you know, whatever their favorite method of communication is, they just run that out to the whole company, but that doesn't really work anymore. No, you really need a more individual approach. And so when I say a goal of mine is to help put the human back uh, in human resources, it's treating people as team members. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know if you played sports, but I know I did growing up and there was nothing more satisfying than to be told you made the team. Yep. And if you made the team, you know, given a role that you could really, you know, dig into and feel like you're part of something bigger. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, even though I participated in individual sports and team sports, team sports were always more satisfying for me. Mm-hmm. And so now if we think about the word employee, that seems like someone who just does a job and gets paid. But a team member has this feeling that they're part of something bigger, just like we did when we were playing sports, Mm -hmm. right? And so words matter. And I also look at the word uh, culture in and of itself, not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if you think about culture is something that you might merely be part of versus I believe community is something you can belong within. And if you think about DEI uh, and its importance, um, in the workforce and, and, and in our civilization, uh, diversity just gets you in the door. And, you know, inclusion gets you a seat at the table, all good. Equity gives you an equal voice. But if you don't feel a sense of belonging, like you do when you're part of a community, then you may not be, may not allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to give up your very best because you're just happy to be in the room where it happens and you don't want to necessarily rock the boat. So belonging is so important and a leader needs to understand how to make their team members feel like they belong on the team. And that way they'll get the very best out of them. They'll have a higher degree of engagement and we know engagement leads to empowerment 
and empowerment leads to ultimately both individual team and organizational success. And I think to do that, um, Mark, as you'd agree, is, I mean, you have to, I mean, leaders and, and organizations are going to have to be more flexible, but also um, employees or team members also mm -hmm. need to maybe be a little bit more open because it's like if we have a lot of people working remotely, then you maybe you do have to be a little bit more open about your circumstances or your needs or desires, or whatever, so that we can figure out between us something that's going to work for both of us. Right. But if I'm not open as a company or you're not open as a as a team member to actually discuss these things, then, you know, it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we know people will open up if they feel like they belong and they feel like there's a sense of trust. We know trust is at the foundation of any good relationship. So why should it be different than in a business relationship? Mm. So my goal is to create and really flip the old annual performance appraisal idea on its head oh. and uh, create something called the purposeful growth plan. Mm -hmm. and, and that really starts, you know, back in this notion of, of Simon Sinek who says, start with why. Yeah. Uh, I agree to a lot of what he says, but I actually believe you should start with who and specifically who you serve. And when you lock in a mental image of who you serve, and I have four realms of service, they're spiritual, relational, personal, and professional. We're whole people, John. We're not just mm -hmm. workers or employees, you know, we're, we're, we're whole people. And if we're allowed to bring our whole self into an office environment, whether it's in person whether it's you know electronically or some hybrid combination, then then we're going to want to give more of ourselves, and we're going to want to share more of what makes us tick. So if you start with who, and you go with this idea of those four kind of four circle Venn diagram of spiritual and relational, that's your family, that may be your friends, your neighbors, your community then your personal, your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, and then your, your professional uh, realm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then once that contact is made and a leader knows that's where their team members is coming from, then they go into this idea of why, which is your motivation. Mm -hmm. like what really lights you up? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what are your motivations for giving of your very best? And as a leader, I'm thinking to myself, how do I help? that team member be that best vision of themselves. And mm -hmm. then we move into their how, which is their superpowers. And, and, and again, how do I uh, ensure that that team member is put in a position to give up their very best for the greater good of the team? Like in Kansas City here, we got Patrick Mahomes. Like you, you wouldn't say, hey, Patrick, you're a pretty darn good quarterback, but um, <laughs> your tackling's not so good. <laughs> we're, we're going to put you on the defensive line for a while and see if you can improve. No, you say, here's a generational talent who can really help the team with their superpowers, their gifts. How do I, as a leader, unlock that for yeah. their greater good and the team? Now, finally, we get to the what. These are your smart goals. This is what we have to accomplish. Yeah. But after I know who you are as a person and how I, as a leader, can listen deeply, observe what your needs are value you and then empower you to be your very best, I'm going to unlock the passion inside of you that we will all, the whole team will benefit from. Yeah. No, it's, I'm, I'm really glad you raised this because I mean, I, I totally agree. And it's been a bit of a, a pet peeve of mine for many years is the performance review. Mm -hmm. um, it, because you're 100% correct. Like we've grown up in this culture where and, and, it's a, and it's a human nature thing that we also have to catch on to. It's like I bring you in, Mark, for your performance review. And I say, Mark, oh, you did you did a couple of things you did really well this year. Congratulations. Now here's the 52 things that we need to work on that you are not very good at. And we focus on, instead of going, how can, uh, to your point, how can I get Mark doing more of what Mark's really, really good at? Yeah. Like, why would I waste my time trying to get Mark to be good at something that he's clearly either not good at, has no interest in being good at, or whatever? I mean, what a waste of time and energy. Well, and, and that's the way that it was yeah. when I was part of uh, PepsiCo when it owned Pizza Hut. You did these 360 reviews, you had all these assessments, <laughs> and they would say, hey, to your point, here are the two or three things you do really well, and here's where we need to help you become more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. 
we need to send you to the field or you need to move from marketing over to finance and, and sharpen up your financial skills or we need to move. And that's what they did. And they moved people around and they tried to make people really well-rounded. Well, those of us now, I think would, would agree a strength-based approach is the right best way to get the most fulfillment out of that team member in a way that they can uh, engage at the highest possible level and they can perform and own the results and feel uh, that, that deeper sense of um, empowerment and fulfillment that will make them stay longer, that will make them you know, be an evangelist and want to tell other people, you got to work for this great company I'm part of, mm -hmm. right? And then it'll also cascade down to the rest of the team. And so this is where I believe that we have an opportunity to, to you know, use this, use this, you know, uh, hybrid environment to change the paradigms that uh, we thought served us so well. And if we were really being honest with ourselves, we would realize no, no, uh, it's no. an inhuman way of doing it. <laughs> and we want to be more human. And those, instead of once a year and drop a bomb on you. Yeah. And then oftentimes, as someone who's been in the C-suite, I've had to make these decisions. You're given so much bonus or you're yep. given so much raise. Uh, and now you've got to justify it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, again, an inhuman way of treating people versus more frequent check-ins. Yeah. And in those check-ins, you check in on all four of those areas. You're who, who you serve, how are you doing on that? Where can I help? Your why, what are your motivations? Are, are you getting that sense of fulfillment while we're working? What can I do to help? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you feel more lit up. Yeah. And then your how is what can I do? Are there other projects that you might want to look into that take your superpowers and can maybe expand them uh, for greater visibility? And then finally, here's the what, okay? We have work to get done. Of course we do. Here are the three or four key priorities. Here's how they're uh, connected to the team's priorities and the broader organization's priorities. And here's your important role that you play and now how can I help you move anything along? Are there any obstacles I can take out of your way? Are there any support or resources you I, need that you're not getting? What can I do to block and tackle for you? And I like what you said about, uh, about motivation because I, I haven't find like sometimes, uh, when people ask about motivation, people feel obliged to give some answer that's maybe, you know, a little bit more, sounds a little bit more esoteric, maybe sounds a little bit more altruistic, you know, so, but I think we have to be open to like people just having whatever their motivations are, their motivations are, and we help if that drives them forward. But I think sometimes we, we push people now into thinking that they have to have some big overarching, you know, yeah. optimistic motivation instead of just, of just, like you said, being who you are and having whatever motivation you have. Yeah, I think there is a, a scary thought that, um, hey, Mark's talking a lot about purpose, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I have a purpose. I'm still trying to figure out what that might be. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it, it, there's a noun and a verb. And the reason I use the word purposeful, because it's a verb, and it's an action word. And when I say purposeful growth, you know, it, it's a, it's a never ending process. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get there. Um, but we're always going to be pursuing it if, if we're really wanting to live a fulfilled life. And so whatever someone's motivations are, they may change in whatever season they're in. Yeah. Right. And so that's where this book comes in, which is it, it packages this whole philosophy within this whole nature as a metaphor uh, for not only personal, professional, relational and spiritual growth. And so if you think about that idea, now you have um, a, a, a broader field to have those discussions yeah. and you're creating a real human connection with your team member instead of it being kind of that, I'm the boss. Well, I don't like the word boss. I use the word leader. No one in, who's ever worked with me ever um, I allowed to call me a boss because leader means I have to earn it. Mm -hmm. And leader means you're not a leader unless people want to follow you and your actions will dictate whether they're going to want to follow you or not. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think that's a great way of putting it is, you know, that, they, that basically the, the assessment of whether you're a good leader is, is pretty easy. It's almost like a salesperson, like you either sell stuff or you don't, <laughs> either people follow you or they don't. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, it's a great, uh, um, poem by Maya Angelou. Um, uh, and I, I, I use it to this day as she said, 
you know, I've learned that people will forget what you told them. They will forget, um, you know, what what you know you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And no one's going to remember the third quarter earnings of 2018 or whatever, but they are going to remember how you led them. And then also, if you're really doing your job right, they're going to want to emulate that. And so there's this ripple effect, which I call paying it backwards in my book. And right. It's literally about, um, you know, those who bear the most fruit have the opportunity and I'll say the responsibility to scatter their seeds to help others along their growth journey. Fantastic. Well, listen, all of Mark's information is going to be below this video, including links to the book. But uh, Mark, before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about your company and about the book. Thanks, John. The, the book is really the foundation of what is a speaking, consulting, and what I'm doing now is putting together a pretty cool e-learning opportunity. So the Purposeful Growth Revolution Four Ways to Grow from Leader to Legacy Builder is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, you can go to my website at markamears.com, and there you'll find a self-assessment. And this is a cool way. It takes about five or six minutes to fill out. And when you're done, you'll have an opportunity to download your report. It's customized just for you, and it's free. And it'll give you a sense of how do you feel about this idea of purposeful growth in each of the four categories of the book, and then how aligned are you with your organization so that you can make an assessment. Is this a great fit for me, or how can I make it a great fit? Or maybe it isn't, and I'm one of the many who've decided to, to pursue a different uh, you know, company or vocation because it no longer serves my purpose. And you can also hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you because I love to learn from other people. So just one of those uh, ways you can do that. And I'd be happy to connect with you. Yeah, listen, thanks again, Mark. Fantastic. And I love the whole the whole person approach. Uh, I think that's that's fantastic because I think that's where we're going. We need that in medicine too. I mean, it's like we do. I, I've been doing a thing on mental health recently, a, a series here. And you know, today you've got a physical ailment, you go to your regular doctor, you got a mental ailment, you go to your psychiatrist, and you're lucky if they ever talk to each other. So I think the whole idea of whole, you know, the whole person, whether it's yeah. you in medicine, or as you say, in the in the workplace, allowing the whole, the totality of the person's character to come through, great stuff. So uh, I would encourage you to go check out the book. Thanks, John. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching, listening, and I'll see you all again soon.